Bible. I went through Exodus, Numbers, Leviticus. I mean, looking for a message, and God gave me this one. Uh, so whether you like it or not, I believe that that's what God gave it to me. But, but and I'm not making excuses because of the lateness. The Bible says we ought always to be ready. We ought to be prepared. You know, uh, be instant in season, out of season. So I will not blame God for any failures or w will I take any uh, glory for any success. It's his. Uh, but uh, this, I feel, is essential uh, because doctrine causes division, and we'll see where Jesus said that very same thing, and then we'll see that. Um, I want to look at it so we don't have to turn a whole lot in the Bible. We'll be looking in Second John. Uh, then we'll look in Jude, and then we'll look in Second Timothy chapter 4, and then we're going to spend the rest of the time in John chapter 6. Uh, starting in uh, Second John, and we'll start at uh, verse 5. Second John, verse 5. And now I beseech thee, lady, be as though, uh, uh, and, and now I beseech thee, lady, not as though I wrote a new commandment unto thee, but that which we had from the beginning, that we love one another. And this is love, that ye walk after his commandments. This is the commandment that ye have heard from the beginning, uh, ye should walk in. In it, for many deceivers, the only way you're going to be, the only way you're going to be alert to deception, is by knowing the Word of God. And when you know the truth, the truth makes you free; it doesn't set you free. But when you know that, you have a liberty that nothing in this world or in our vocabulary can express, because it's an it's a divine liberty that we have, not only to walk in the truth, but to be steadfast and take a militant stand on it. For many deceivers are entered into the world who confess not that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh. This is a deceiver and an antichrist. Look to yourselves that ye lose not those things which ye have wrought, uh, but that, ye, that we receive a full reward. You know, uh, I've seen this, it's lethargy for sure, but I've seen this in what you would call Christendom. And that is, I'm glad I'm saved. Don't worry too much about rewards. I'm enjoying this life the way it is, but I'm glad I'm not going to hell. It's not that they're happy that they're going to be in holiness and be in the presence of Jesus Christ. They're just happy they're not going to hell. Well, I tell you, if that's the salvation you got, there's a remedy for it, and it's called being born again. Now, I'm telling you, because therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. There's whole new appetites, and, you, and the evidence of the word of uh, evidence of salvation is as newborn babes desire, not just want, but desire the sincere milk of the word that you may grow thereby. Amen. Now, and if people did that when it was outlawed in the dark ages, and we have the word of God today freely given to us, it's a shame on us when we're not availing ourselves of it. Of course, I think that's the, the, the enemy's tactic. He couldn't burn it out, so what he did was he flooded the market with it, and now it's so there that people don't pay attention to it, and then it's been perverted by the revisions. And you can see the disaster of that in Genesis uh, chapter 3, when the word of God was revised for the first time, it brought forth death. And it was revised with Eve. Now, Look to yourselves that we lose not those things which we have wrought, but that you receive a full reward. One day you're going to bow in the presence of Jesus Christ if you're saved. You're not going to want to be there bankrupt. You don't work and just, uh, you never go into, I mean, we don't have this mentality where we go into a corporation, we apply for a job just like the pastor mentioned this morning. It, 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 it dumbfounded him that he got a job at Boeing. I'm glad he did. I, I know God works all these things out. I look at my life, there's things that I just couldn't believe that God worked things out. I wasn't capable of it. I wasn't even worthy of it, but God did those things. He said, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. But you never go into a corporation if we were putting that situation and start in middle management and then ask when the janitor's job is up for bid. You don't do that. You ask for when the CEO's job. Now, what makes us different about this and eternity? Make sure that you don't lose your reward. What does that mean? That means there is a reward that you can lose, and you'll regret it. And if you read uh, 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 Daniel chapter 12, it says some will be raised to righteousness and some will be raised to utter contempt. 
And I do believe that these are believers, not the lost, but they're going to be utter shame and contempt. And Jesus said, whosoever is ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him also shall the Son of Man be ashamed. And I do not believe, I wouldn't waste my time reading religion, uh, books about religion. I don't care if it's, if it's Islam or Buddhist or whatever. All those re- I wouldn't read them, but I doubt very seriously. I know that they wouldn't start out in the beginning, Vishnu created the heaven and the earth. I knew that they wouldn't do that. But I don't think that they would allow for any of their followers to be ashamed of them. Why did Jesus say, whosoever is ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation? Why? Because Satan is the enemy of the word of God, and he will make you feel shame. Greater than fear, he'll make you feel shame for standing for Jesus Christ. But you can stand for religion all day long, I, 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 and nobody will bother you. It was like I told you that time, um, uh, they gave a straight preacher a Koran. I said, what is that? And, they, and when he was preaching, he said, it's a Koran. I said, throw it in the garbage. And man, those people got, I mean, they just got shocked that we threw a Koran in the garbage. But they didn't get shocked a few minutes early when somebody handed uh, some burgers on a track, and they ripped it up and threw it on the ground. They didn't get ashamed of that. I'm telling you, you have a reward. God's given us a reward. You better hold it tenaciously because Satan will try to slip it away from you. And if he slips that away from you, he makes you an excuse for somebody to go to hell. Well, so-and-so is supposed to be a Christian. And man, I, I live better than they do. Yeah, right. Look to yourselves that you lose uh, not thing, uh, those things which we have wrought, but that you receive a full reward. Whosoever transgresses and abideth not in the doctrine of Christ hath not God. Now, that, does that tell you something? In the Gospel of John, uh, Judas said to him, not as scared, how is it that you reveal yourself to us and not to the world? He said, if a man loves me, he'll keep my word. Amen. That's right. Now, you want the acid test for your salvation? What do you do with the word of God? You bring it to church on Sunday and that's it? <laughs> no, not, it's not salvation. It's not the evidence of salvation. The vital sign for a Christian. I mean, if somebody gets in a wreck out here and the EMS comes up there, they don't check to see if your credit cards are paid. They check for vital signs. What's that? For pulse, for breath, for anything. Dilation of the eyes, they check for vital signs. The vital sign for a Christian is a desire for the word of God. Um, um, Whosoever transgresses and abideth not in the doctrine of Christ hath not God. He that abideth in the doctrine of Christ, he hath both the Father and the Son. And we're talking about doctrine. Um, if there come any unto you and bring not this doctrine, receive him not into your house, neither bid him God speed. You'd never say God bless you to a Jehovah's Witness when he leaves your door after he says God bless you to you. Because he doesn't know God and you do and you're not it's supposed to ask God to bless false doctrine. I mean, it's just a glib thing. They say, oh, somebody sneezes, God bless you. Uh, Well, that's almost blasphemy, you know, if you really don't mean it. And I don't know how a sneeze evokes a blessing from God. I just really never figured that out. Verse 11, for he that biddeth him God's speed is a partaker of his evil deeds. Having many things to write unto you, I would not write with paper and ink, but I trust to come unto you and to speak face to face that your joy may be full. Uh, the children of thy elect sister greet thee. Now, I, I, I'm going to spiritualize verse 12 because I do believe this. Jesus said, I've got many things to say to you, but you're not able to bear them yet. Well, where are those things that he's going to tell us that we're not able to bear us? They're in here. And there's a time as we mature as a Christian that we'll be able to bear us. And I think that that's what John is talking about here, too. I know he says face to face, but I'm face to face with my Bible. Amen. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for your word. We pray, Father, that you would just speak to our hearts and help us to realize that the day and age that we're living in, it is not lost. It is apostasy, but only we, me, each individual can determine whether they want to fall into that apostasy or adhere to the word of God and be a honest and true and a loving servant of you. Now, Father, we pray that you'll make that clear. Even though our words may be feeble, we pray that you'll make that clear to each individual. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, he's talking about doctrine here. Now, I want to look at Jude, and, and then I will look at First John, and uh, 
Uh, no, I mean 2 Timothy. Did I say 1 John? 2 Timothy. Uh, but we'll look at Jude here. I want to read uh, down uh, just some of these verses and make comments on it because it is also instruction for this day of apostasy that we're living in. Jude, the servant of Jesus Christ, the brother of James, uh, to them who are uh, sanctified by God the Father and preserved in Jesus Christ and called. Mercy unto you and peace and love be multiplied. When I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith. Now, the word contend means, you know, when they have a heavyweight years ago when they, I don't know if it was ever legitimate or not, but whenever they had the heavyweight uh, uh, boxing uh, fight, you know what they said? That, uh, um, uh, I forget what the brown bomber's name was. Uh, Joe Lewis, when he was fighting Smelling, he was contending for the heavyweight championship of the world. He was contending. What was he doing? Sitting there playing checkers or having coffee with him? No, he's trying to beat him up. <laughs> See? And he was standing, he was taking the fight. So when Paul says, I mean, uh, when uh, Jude says here that she should earnestly contend for the faith. Now that's a stand, and you know where you're going to get your greatest opposition when you contend for the faith? It's not so much in the world, it's in the church in the church they're going to write you off as contentious oh yeah <laughs> are you kidding me hey no he just wants to quote the bible well i'll tell you what i'd rather quote god than anybody else Amen. and uh but that you should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints for there are certain men crept in unawares who were before of old ordained to this condemnation listen folks these people that come at you are not coming at you with false doctrine because they're stupid and you're going to straighten them out you see that in Galatians chapter 1 they would pervert it's not ignorance by default it is a hell-bent desire to pervert the word of God these men had crept in unawares privily and they Paul said to whom we gave place by subjection no not for an hour why that the truth of the gospel might continue with you it is that important. You say, is it really, I mean, are you getting a little overboard on that and you're just getting a little bit too hyper? Well, I'll tell you one thing. I'm glad I'm not going to hell and I'd really get hyper about my soul spending eternity in hell. I'm glad I'm saved. So I can't get that excited. I, my body couldn't take getting that excited. Yours couldn't either if you really, really thought about that. For there are certain men crept in unawares who were before of old ordained to this condemnation, ungodly men turning the grace of God into lasciviousness. Now, how did they do that? Well, you know, uh, you're saved. Uh, Jesus said, I give unto you eternal life, and they shall never perish, right? And so you can't lose your salvation. Well, that is a doctrine that doesn't benefit us. That's a doctrine that glorifies God. But then you think, well, I can just live, um, uh, I can just uh, merrily, 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 life is but a dream. I can eat, drink, and be merry, and hell with tomorrow. Well, that isn't the way. That isn't it at all. And so they teach that lasciviousness because, hey, you don't have to, you don't have to be a, uh, you know, and I've said this before, when I first got saved, they said, uh, oh, so-and-so's got an Elijah complex. And I said, man, don't want to get one of them. It sounds like leprosy. Uh, but uh, what is an Elijah complex? Elijah said, it's only me, God, that's standing for you. And God said, no, there's 7,000 that hadn't bowed their knee to Baal. But you can't name any of them except Obadiah. But, but uh, uh, Elijah stood for God. And I thought about that. You know, when I thought it was a disease, I thought about that and thought about that. And I have a message. All I've got is a title, an Elijah complex, what it is and how to get one. Well, the message would be just stay in your Bible. You'll get one. You get one. I'm not going to rely on any of you, and I have respect for some of you more than even others, and that's just the way it is because I see you here more often, and I, some of them I don't know, even though I've been here. But I'll tell you what, uh, I, I tell you what, I do not rely on even my pastor, and I have an utmost respect for him. The Bible says we ought to esteem him in love. He's got a position, and we need to esteem him and hold him up in prayer because there's an attack on him that ain't on me. It's very easy for me to get up here and spout off because I don't have to uh, deal with the fallout. He does. Uh, but the thing of it is, uh, we need to really uh, 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 keep that in prayer, uh, keep him in prayer. Uh, anyway, um, 
Uh, so they changed of God, turned the uh, grace of God into lasciviousness, denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. I will therefore put you in remembrance, though ye once knew this, how that the Lord, having saved the people out of the land of Egypt, afterwards destroyed them that believed not. Why? Because they brought their unbelief with them. You know, they, he saved them, and when we experience great things in God. Now, if you're saved, I don't care if God's given you a good job. He's given me a good job. He gave the pastor a good job, and he gave him a high and holy calling, uh, too. And now he's got that job, and that's being the pastor of this church. And I'm sure he made more money with less uh, aggravation uh, working for Boeing than he does here. And I know he wouldn't trade positions and go back to where he was. And that's why I'll stay here, because he has a heart for God. Uh, but anyway, uh, and I'm not here to bolster him up. He needs to be bolstered, but I'm not over here to flatter him. He knows that. Uh, but uh, they, uh, uh, and when he, afterwards they brought him in, they, uh, they believe him. What I was going to say is everyone that is born again has experienced a, a, great, a greater mir a miracle than when God spoke the earth and the world into existence. And you know what that is? When he born you again. Because it was something much greater than you could ever do yourself. You couldn't, you couldn't change yourself. I know. I've tried to change and turn over new leaves. And that whole tree faded before I could even get it turned over. And I'm not trying to glorify sin. I was just a mess. And, God, and I say this. I wasn't smart enough to get saved. I was sinful enough to get saved. But once you experience being born again, and then we doubt God for all the peripherals, all the secondary things that don't even make a hill of beans in comparison to your soul. Jesus said, what would a prophet you gain the whole world, lose your own soul? What would you give in exchange for your soul? You're going to heaven. What difference would it make if you starved to death to get there, if you're going to heaven? I mean, he changed you. He made you a new. Now, none of us want to live a miserable life. I don't either. I want to get through this life wrinkle-free if I can. But when I bow in his presence, I want to show up with a few scars. I mean, I really do. I don't want them, and I'm not a masochist. But I'll tell you what, when I get in his presence, I wanted it to cost me something. Paul said it did him. And the angels which kept not their first estate. This is amazing. Now, I've never seen God. You've never seen him. We've seen the evidence of him. The heavens declare the glory of God. The firmament showeth his handiwork. Day unto day utter his speech. Night unto night showeth knowledge. And there is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. I didn't want to quote all that just to show you I could quote it. What I wanted to quote that for, for is there's no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. That the aborigine who doesn't have the intellect that I have, and that's my own thought, he knows that there's a creator. He doesn't have the intellect that these PhDs coming out of the colleges have at U of M and other universities, but he knows that there's a creator and a PhD doesn't. The Bible says man by wisdom knew not God. But here's the thing. The angels that kept not their first estate. I've never seen God. I see the evidence of God. And I love this verse in Romans chapter 1. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are and, and you can quote it, I can quote it, but we could have never originated it. The invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen. <laughs> clearly seen. Being understood by the things that are even his eternal power and Godhead. Why? So that God can show how omnipotent he is? No, so that they are without excuse. God witnesses to himself every day. But here's the angels that saw him physically and the angels that kept not their first estate. That's an amazing thing. They saw omnipotence in person. They saw omniscience in person. They saw the whole being of God and his, that he's supreme and he had no beginning and they saw him and they kept not their first estate. That's an amazing thing to me. And when Satan uh, fell, he took, and the only place we get this is in the book of Revelation, where the dragon took a third of the stars with him. The angels were crossed. That's the only place I could get it from. I never heard anything else, but I do believe that he did that. And how many did he take with him? Well, we live in an environment that has 7.5 billion people in it right now, give or take. And uh, if they have any more uh, shootings, they'll probably be taken. I mean, it's crazy. But anyway, um, uh, but so we think if he took a third... You know, he must have got about 30 million. Well, we're thinking like pikers if we think like that. We're talking about an infinite, ever-expanding universe that is populated 
with beings that we don't even have any clue of what they look like except the description when it said they look like this and they had four faces of a beast and all that and they look like this and all that. But we've never seen, and this is a universe that is filled with, we couldn't even come up with zillions. I don't think we could come up with a, a calculator that could put that many zeros in there. So when he took a third of them with him, it must have been a whole lot. And he's got a lot of demons and they're all very active today. Now, um, and the angels which kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation, he hath reserved an everlasting change under darkness unto the judgment of the great day. Even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the other cities about them, in like manner giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh, are set forth as an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. Likewise also these filthy dreamers, and, and it says, likewise also. So all of these things, these, these, they're apparent today. The, 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 uh, the angels that kept not their first aid, those people that inhabited Sodom and Gomorrah, likewise also these filthy dreamers defile the flesh, despise dominion, speak evil of dignities. Yet Michael, yet Michael the archangel, in, when contending with the devil, uh, he disputed about the body of Moses, durst not bring against him a railing accusation, but said, the Lord rebuke thee. You know, that's the answer that we have for the devil. You know, we don't talk to the devil. That ain't real smart. Uh, but we have an answer for him. The Lord rebuke thee. You know, because uh, uh, if you're God's child, you're, you're actually even better than the angels. Do you know that? You have a position better than the angels. You're adopted into God's family by the blood of Jesus Christ. Amen. Now, but these speak evil of those things which they know not, uh, but what they know naturally as brute beast, brute beast, and those things, they corrupt themselves. So they're talking naturally. They don't realize that this is a holy, uh, eternal, spiritual book, and it, has, and it feeds our spirit. But they have to break things down naturally, and if they can't understand them, they have to give it a natural bent, or they have to uh, uh, dispel the whole thing and say it's just, uh, it's just uh, imaginary or something. I mean, you have people, and I, and I don't waste my time doing that, but I've said this before. Uh, around Easter years ago, and this is before cable, when they had uh, Channel 56 and PBS, and they probably still do. Uh, but around Easter, especially, not even around Christmas, but around Easter, they would always have uh, uh, things about Jesus Christ, historic things about Jesus Christ. And you know who was on there? THDs, PhDs, they were all uh, doctors of divinity. And you know what they were doing? They were torpedoing the Bible. They were making it, oh, well, you know, there was a lot of miracles going on in Jesus' day, as if it was some kind of a cosmic uh, uh, refraction from the sun that bounced off one of the planets and then made people miracle workers. And now we don't have them anymore. The reason why there was miracle workers in that day was because Jesus imparted that to the apostles and they raised the dead and they did miracles, but they tried to dispel it by saying, oh, there was a lot of miracles, you know, uh, aliens and whatever, you know. And they really tried to uh, just undermine the Bible. These speak evil of those things which they know not, but what they know naturally is brute beasts and those things they corrupt themselves. Woe unto them, and this is the last verse I'm going to hit in here, and then we'll go to 2 Timothy. Woe unto them, for they have gone in the way of Cain and ran greedily after the heir of Balaam for reward and perished in the gainsaying of Cori. They, woe unto them, for they have gone in the way of Cain. What was Cain's problem? Jealousy. Now, these are the things that attack the ministry. These are the things that attack the ministry. There's jealousy. And then they've gone in the way of Balaam. What is that? Well, he was a hired preacher. He was a hired. You can read about these in, uh, in uh, Numbers, I believe. And he was hired by Balak to go on over here. And, uh, and, uh, and the thing that he did, the thing that Balaam did, and he's also identified in the book of Revelation, I think at the church of Thyatira, one of them, uh, that uh, they, uh, they used the doctrine of Balaam. And what was the doctrine of Balaam? Well, Balak hired Balaam to curse Israel because Israel was, when they would try to go in and pay uh, to go into this uh, thing, and they said, we won't go but the king's highway, and they come on out against them and they fought them. Well, God uh, used them to kill Og, king of Bashan, and uh, I forget the other guy's name, uh, but uh, they killed them. 
Well, when Balak saw them coming, and they were a precision army. If you could see them from a mountain, they walked in precision. They were not a marauding bunch of people just walking around with their hands in their pocket. They were a precision. You look at it when the Bible says that. There was three tribes on this side. There was three tribes on that side. There was three tribes in the front. There was three tribes in the back. And when they walked across the desert, you know what they pictured? The cross. Isn't that something? And the, and the, and the tabernacle was in the center. I'm telling you, read it in Ezekiel. Anyway, uh, Balak called them, uh, called Balaam because Balaam, had he was one of these unique people in the Bible, and he had the power to curse people, apparently, or to bless them. And so uh, uh, Balak paid him, and he wouldn't do it. You know, you, you know that. It's very interesting, and it's one of those things when you read the Bible, you don't, uh, you don't lose uh, track of it because it's interesting. You know, the doctrine is the thing you have to really come back to over and over and over again because you think of everything else when it comes to doctrine. But when you get into Balaam and those things, when you get into David and Joab and, and all these other things, especially David and Bathsheba, you don't think about shining your shoes. You're thinking about what he did with Bathsheba. I, I, I'm not trying to be filthy here or fallacious. I'm just saying there's some things that you can concentrate on easier than other. And he, and he called uh, and he called, Bala, uh, Bala, called Balaam and he said, now curse me these people. And then he took them up there and he took them on seven places and he blessed them, and he blessed them, and he blessed them. And he says, I can't curse whom God has him. But you know what the doctrine of Balaam was? As long as they're serving God, you can't curse them. You get them to sin, God will take care of them. And that's the doctrine of Balaam. And they brought these Moabite women in, and the Moabite women went into them, and they started uh, just fornicating. And they did that, and they got them to worship their gods that fast. God's people that fast. They've gone in the way of ba uh, Balaam uh, for reward and perished in the gainsaying of Cory. Now, this is one of the things that preachers have to contend with. Cory and his Dathan and Abiram, uh, it was Cory and Dathan and Abiram, they stood up and they said, Moses, you take too much upon yourself. He didn't take anything upon him. God gave him that position. God gave him that position. And you know what? something about uh, Moses? He didn't want it. He wasn't looking for the power and the leadership and to be a king over Israel. He was willing to sacrifice himself when God was going to judge him. And he says, I'm going to destroy them all and I'll make a nation out of you. And he says, then you take me as a sacrifice. He was willing to go to hell. He was like Paul. I could wish myself accursed. And they said, you take too much upon yourself. And he said, you know, you take too much upon yourself. If God creates something new. So they got all Dathan, Cory, uh, Cory and Abai, uh, uh, um, Nathan, yeah, and they got all them and all their families and all that pertained to them and God opened up the ground. You talk about a sinkhole. God took them up the ground. They went fast in the hill. Why? Because they defied God's man. Now, the preachers that get up here that are weak need and not here, but the preachers that get up in a pulpit and are weak need and they ain't got nothing to say, they'll say, don't touch God's anointed. Well, that doesn't mean that they're God's anointed. <laughs> I mean, you know, they're just they're just using that as superstition to make you fear. And if you do not walk in the word of God, you will be manipulated by superstition. I guarantee it. Because there's nothing you can do to avoid it. Now let's go to uh, 2 Timothy. And I'm not going to be here long, but uh, this is very uh, uh, simple. It's been used quite a bit here. I charge thee therefore, in, in verse 4, 2 Timothy 4, I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing in his kingdom. Now, I remember years ago in this very church teaching Sunday school, I couldn't wait to get to the next verse. Preach the word. Be instant in season. Man, I wanted to charge. I mean, I just really wanted to get on that horse and charge. Man, I, I was really all full of vinegar, you know, and, and uh, just wanted to fight. And, uh, and I just went right through that verse and the Holy Spirit just cut me short and said, what would you just say? And I said, I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing in his kingdom. And God says, what does that mean? No, I didn't say it exactly like that. But he does take the resurrection and the judgmental power of God. This is very powerful, this first verse, because he used it for the springboard for what he's about to say, and that is preach the word. Amen. It's not not something that you should do or could do or it would be nice if you did. It's an, it's an authoritative command. Preach the word. Be instant in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort. Now, I know preachers that like to reprove. 
I know preachers that like to rebuke. I know some that like to exhort. But none of those work unless you use with all long-suffering and doctrine. You have to have long-suffering. I forget who it was, but they said, no, I think it was Dwight L. Moody. Somebody said, I wouldn't want to hear anybody preach on hell, but I listen to uh, Dwight L. Moody because when he preaches on hell, he preaches with a tear in his eye. See? And with all long-suffering and doctrine. Um, now, preach the word, be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort, with all long-suffering and doctrine, for the time will come. Now, if God says the time will come, and we believe that we're living at the brink of the rapture, which I really do, then don't you think the time would be here? <laughs> well, absolutely. You know, you read that in 2 Thessalonians 2, you know, except there come a falling away first. That word falling away, you can look it up. It's apostasy. We're living in the apostasy. You don't believe that? Well, look around. And you can go to over one of these feel-good, coffee-drinking churches, and you'll find a lot of people there. You won't find anybody. We've got more on Sunday night than they do because they don't even have church on Sunday night. And it's pointless anyway. But on Sunday morning, you'll find it full of capacity. Come as you are, leave worse. I mean, uh, leave as you are, you know. Uh, they won't leave better because they're not getting doctrine. They're being fooled in the hell. And you know why they're being fooled? Because they want to be fooled. The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. They want to be fooled. They want, to, they want you, in fact, it says that in the Bible, speak unto us smooth things. Smooth things. They got a prophet going up to uh, Israel, and he said, why don't you go down to Judah? They, they like hearing that stuff. They kicked them out of Israel. They said, don't preach your word here. Go down to, go down to Judah. They like that stuff. <laughs> you know, and, and you witness to somebody, and if they know another Christian, he said, why don't you go talk to him? He likes to talk about that. I don't want to hear it. I mean, I've heard that myself. Anyway, uh, 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 preach the word, be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. But watch thou therefore in all things, endure affliction. If you stand for doctrine, you're going to get afflicted. You're going to get afflicted. So it says, endure affliction and do the work of an evangelist. My pastor is a pastor, but he's also an evangelist. I'm an evangelist. If you're saved, you're an evangelist. You do the work of an evangelist. Well, what is that? And I was talking to um, Stephen. He, he comes in here on uh, Sunday school. And I was talking to him yesterday. He says, oh, if we could just get a more, something to the effect, if we can get just more the world to come into church, we could witness them. I said, that's the wrong thing. That happened with Constantine. Before that, and, and I know this from the book of uh, when Paul wrote to the Corinthians, that he says uh, in, in relationship to speaking in tongues, he said, if one comes into you that's unlearned and they're not saved, he said, they'll think you're mad. The very tenor of the words is, is that they didn't think and they didn't expect the unbelievers to go to church. That was Constantine that made that popular. The church was made, not exclusively, but it was for the born-again believers. And they are not preached to, they are edified, they're taught. Now, I know our pastor's a preacher, and, and, and I'm glad he preaches. I enjoy his preaching. Amen. Keeps me awake. I'm falling asleep in my own teeth. No, but anyway, but, uh, but, but he does, but, uh, but, um, I, gotta, I shouldn't do that because I lose my train of thought. Uh, but the church is taught. And then you go on out into a gainsaying, God-hating, Christ-rejecting world where you shine as lights and you evangelize the world. And you say, well, they don't listen to me. Don't give up. You never know down the road when the seed that you planted might bring forth fruit. But don't give up even if it doesn't bring forth fruit because you are told to be a witness, not a winner. When it says, he that winneth souls is wise, if you look that up in context, in the book of Proverbs, it means if you have a winsome personality. If you're a salesman, you don't want to be abrupt and all that stuff. But we don't win souls, we witness the souls. It is their responsibility. And you will never find that magic bullet in the Bible where you say, bow your head and repeat after me. You just don't find it. Don't you think that God would have put it in there if it would have worked? And certainly Paul would make us pygmies in comparison to him for intellect on a lateral level. 
And I mean that. They said about Paul that the world would have heard of him if he'd not been converted, and he would have been up there with Aristotle and all those brainiacs in ancient history. And don't you think he would have thought of saying, this is the prayer that you use? See, listen, we are to witness. Jesus, uh, going in his uh, ministry, a rich young ruler comes to him and said, good master, what must I do to be saved? And I'm telling you, any of us would have made him a deacon right there because he was rich. I mean, we would have got him signed, sealed, and delivered as a good uh, member in, in standing. And Jesus said, you, you, why call us me good? There's none good but one, that is a God. And then he called him master. He didn't believe that he was God. And by the way, and we'll see this in uh, John chapter 6 when we get to it, uh, but uh, you wouldn't have had any advantage in Jesus' day believing in him than you have today. You would not have any advantage in looking at him and believing on him than you have today. God is equal opportunity. The grace that brings salvation hath appeared unto all men. And we'll see that momentarily. Now, uh, and then it says, uh, uh, endure afflictions and do the work of an evangelist. Now, let's go on over to John chapter 6. We're going to look, it's a long chapter. We're going to look at the whole chapter. I'm basically going to read it because it's pretty much self-explanatory. Oh, we got plenty of time. I mean, I'll just do that. No, I'm kidding. Um, I was telling somebody, I said, oh, it's going to be hard to figure out tonight. On Sunday nights, we're usually geared to about 10 or 12 minutes. <laughs> so, uh, bad chance. Uh, uh, chapter 6. After these things, Jesus went over the Sea of Ti uh, Galilee, which is the Sea of Tiberias, and a, in a great multitude. Now, in Matthew... It'll talk about 5,000. And the reason why I want to stress that is we do not have to exaggerate the, exaggerate the miracles of God. We don't have to do that. And a great multitude followed him uh, because they saw the miracles. Why did they follow him? Because they saw the miracles which he did on them that were diseased. Now, people will be attracted to those kind of things. doesn't mean they're attracted to the truth. It means they're attracted to the display. And people will display things in church. There'll be all kinds of uh, things. You know, the Bible says preach the word. He didn't say put on a performance. You know, uh, I went to a church. First time I saw it, I liked it. It was around Easter, and it was, uh, I forget what they called it, but it was about the crucifixion, uh, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. I was emotionally moved by it. I mean, I did. I went there next time, and uh, I didn't like it as much. And then I went to it one other time, and I really didn't like it at all. But the thing of it is, we can be, in fact, it says that in Jude, we, didn't, we weren't go there anyway, but they're sensual, having not the spirit. We were told to preach the word. It's not using sensationalism. It's not using emotionalism, little tear-jerking stories that get us to weep and pull out our handkerchiefs and feel like we've gotten close to the Lord. No, all you did was get emotional. If you want to do that, watch the uh, commercials about the, the kids that they're feeding in, in third world countries with uh, cleft palates, you know, and stuff like that. I, I mean, it's a heartbreak, and I'm not trying to be funny there, but if you want to be emotional, then you can watch stuff like that. that that'll, that's, uh, and I don't even know how that true that is. They might be exploiting that because most of them have a 90% operating expense. It means 10% of what you send goes to the uh, situation. Uh, okay. Uh, and great multitudes followed him because they saw the miracles which he did on them that were diseased. And Jesus went uh, up into the mountain, and there he sat with the disciples. And the Passover, the feast of the Jews, was nigh. When Jesus then lifted up his eyes and saw a great company uh, come unto him, he said unto Philip, Whence shall we uh, buy bread that these may eat? And this he said because, to prove him, for he himself knew what he would do. You know, when the Bible says to some things, and we looked at this a couple of weeks ago, when God says, when Micaiah says, I saw all of Israel scattered without a, uh, 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 a king, and that was when Ahab was going up to Ramoth Gilead and he was going to die. Uh, but he says, uh, God says, who will deceive, who will go down and deceive uh, Ahab that he might fall in Ra Ramoth Gilead? Now, the Bible says it that way. It doesn't mean that God didn't know what, he, what was going to happen. It's just that we wouldn't know what was going to happen unless he said it that way. See? So he already knew what he was going to do. And uh, he himself knew what he would do. Philip answered him, 
200 penny worth of bread is not sufficient for them that every uh, one of them may eat a little. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon, Peter, bro, uh, Simon Peter's brothers, said unto him, uh, There is a lad here which hath five barley loaves and two small fishes, but what are they among so many? Now, the reason why I say we don't have to exaggerate uh, God's miracles and miracles of Jesus, two fish and five loaves wouldn't have fed 15 people. So when God says there's 5,000, we don't have to say, well, they had a wife and two children, so that's 20,000. They wouldn't have fed 15 people. So we don't have to exaggerate the miracle of God. Uh, I mean, there was, uh, and it's in Matthew there, it gives it the number of 5,000. Uh, and it's the same miracle because they received 12 baskets at the end of it. And Jesus said unto them, verse 10, make the men sit, uh, sit down. Now there was much grass in the place, so the rest, uh, uh, the men sat down, uh, in number, uh, in number, uh, in number about 5,000. Oh, here it is too as well. Uh, and Jesus took the loaves and when he had given a thanks, he distributed to disciples and his disciples to them that were sat down and likewise of the fishes as much as they would. Uh, when they were filled, he said unto the disciples, gather up the fragments that remain and nothing be lost, that nothing be lost. Therefore, they gathered them together and filled 12 baskets with the fragments and of the five barley loaves, uh, which remained over and above unto them uh, uh, that had eaten. Uh, I'm thinking uh, this miracle here. You know, we always limit God. I mean, like I said, we've experienced salvation. You can't experience anything greater if you've seen God replicate in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. And, and, and you put that against your salvation, that would be secondary to your salvation. But we recognize that and we, and, and we understand that and we've experienced that. And yet we worry about things because we look at our finances or whatever it is, or medical things, and we say, oh man, this, this is just the way it is. And it's, and it's just not enough. God can make it enough. I mean, I cannot keep God's books, but I'm telling you, and I've quit trying to figure it out, how God always supplies my need, and I cannot work it out with a calculator, and I can't work my health out by calisthenics, but God's given me good health, and I appreciate that. I mean, I have my problems, but they're mental. <laughs> anyway, um, verse 14, uh, then those men which they, uh, then those men, when they had seen the miracle, now you got to keep in mind this so we don't lose our train of thought here. Uh, then those men, when they seen the miracle that Jesus did, said, This is of a truth, not God, that prophet that should come into the world. Now, that prophet, they did not know who he was because in the Gospel of John, it says, Art thou Elias or that prophet? That prophet is identified in the book of Acts as Jesus Christ, but they did not know it. It is it, because it says, uh, Paul, uh, uh, Luke brings out that that prophet was Jesus Christ. Now, um, and I have the reference for it. I've got it written down. If you want it, I'll give it to you later. Uh, that should come uh, into the world. When Jesus therefore perceived that they would come and, and make him, uh, take him by force and make him a king, he departed, and you know, they, he, offered, he offered the kingdom. John preached the gospel of the kingdom. God would have set up the kingdom. When Israel rejected him, then he would tell people, and I've uh, said this sarcastically years ago, that you know everybody would get up in my life versus mine is being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in me will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. Another person might get up and said, my life verse is uh, I can do all things through Christ, which strengthens me. And it's good to have a focal point, you know, uh, that we can think of. I, I rely on that uh, uh, Philippians 1.6. But I've said uh, the uh, life verse for most professing Christians is when Jesus said, see thou tell no man. That's sarcasm. Because when Jesus withdrew the offer to Israel, and when he would heal somebody, he said, see thou tell no man, but they still went abroad witnessing. Uh, when uh, Jesus therefore perceived that they would come and take him by force and make him a king, he departed uh, again into a mountain himself alone. And when even was now come, his disciples went down into the sea and entered into a ship and went over to sea towards Capernaum. 
and it was now dark, and Jesus was not come to them. And the sea arose by reason of a great wind and blew. So when they had rowed about five and twenty or thirty furlongs, they see Jesus walking on the sea. And you have that count in Matthew, and that's where Jesus, uh, where Peter says, "Well, bid me to come out to thee," and he did. And drawing nigh unto the ship, and they were afraid. But he said unto them, "It is I; be not afraid." Then they willingly received him into the ship, and listen to this. And immediately, and they were toiling against that storm, and immediately the ship was at the land where they went. <laughs> you know, God is a God is an infinite God. We limit him by our unbelief. He's infinite. He can do things that we cannot even see. I mean, we can't even, we can't even express it, but he does things for us. And the only limitation that he has is our own unbelief. They limited the Holy One of Israel, it says in the Bible, Old Testament. Jesus could not do many miracles in his own hometown. You know why? Because of their unbelief. But he saith unto them, It is I, be not afraid. And they willingly received him. Okay, verse 22. And the day following, when the people which stood on the other side of the sea saw there, uh, uh, saw there was none other boat there, save the one whereunto his disciples were entered, and that Jesus went not with his disciples into the boat, but uh, that the disciples were gone away alone, howbeit there were other boats which came from Tiberias, nigh unto the place where they did eat bread. After that, the Lord had uh, given thanks. When the people therefore saw that Jesus was not there, neither his disciples, they also took shipping and uh, came unto Capernaum uh, seeking for Jesus. And when they had found him on the other side of the sea, they said unto him, Rabbi, whence comest thou hither? Not Lord. Uh, Jesus answered them and said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, ye seek me. Now here's the thing. Verily, verily, ye seek me not, uh, 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 ye seek me not because ye saw the miracles, but because ye did eat of the loaves and were filled. They were coming to him for what they could get on a very low level, and that was a physical level, not spiritual. Labor not for that meat which perisheth, but for that meat which enter, uh, entereth in endureth unto eternal life, which the Son of Man shall give unto you, for him hath God the Father sealed. You know, we can labor for these things, and we can say, well, life is so important, and it's critical, and God's secondary, but you're only going to live here a short time. You're going to live in eternity forever. Amen. So that makes that primary and life secondary. I mean, uh, I, I'm not a hero or anything like that, and I'm not a tough guy or anything like that, but I'll tell you what, uh, death doesn't frighten me as much as life does. Then said they unto him, what shall we do that we might work the works of God? Now see, they wanted something that they could see in themselves. Uh, Jesus answered and said unto them, this is the work of God, that ye believe on him whom the Father has sent. Read Romans chapter 4, I'm not even going to look into it, but Romans chapter 4, Abraham believed God. If Abraham could trust in his works, he has where of the glory, but not before God. But Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him for righteousness. Uh, and he was a Gentile when he did it. Verse uh, 30, and uh, they, said, uh, they said, therefore, unto him, what sign? <laughs> this is, this is uh, just unbelievable. What sign showest thou that we may see and believe? What doest thou? Our fathers did eat manna in the desert. I mean, just yesterday, just yesterday, Jesus took two fish, five loaves, and fed 5,000. And they said, what sign showest thou? In the Gospel of John, it said, what, uh, show us a sign from heaven. And he said, an even one adulterous generation seeketh after a sign, but there be no sign given it to it, but the sign of Jonas the prophet. But he said, but when you say, you say the red sky in the morning, uh, you say the, the sky is red and lowering, there'll be foul weather today. But red sky in the evening, you say the weather will be pleasant. Well, the Navy has that term, red sky in the morning, sailor take warning, red sky at night, sailor's delight. But, but they, and he said, you can discern the face of the sky, you cannot discern the times that we're in right now. See? Uh, our fathers did eat manna, verse 31, in the wilderness, as it is written, he gave them bread from heaven. Then Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Moses gave you not that bread from heaven, but my Father giveth you the true bread. Now we're going to get into divi uh, 
doctrine that, that divides. Jesus said, I have not come to bring peace. And he said this in Luke, I have come to bring division. Well, he did say that, but in Luke, he said, I've come to bring division. Doctrine divides. Now, uh, for the bread of God, verse uh, 33, for the bread of God is he, not it, which cometh down from heaven and giveth life unto the world. You know, you go uh, uh, in contrast to this, to John chapter 4, and here's these men that just seen a miracle the day before with the bread and uh, uh, the loaves and the fishes. And then you have the Samaritan woman who comes out at high noon to protect herself from all the scorn that she would have gotten because there's a time when women went out to draw and it was out early in the morning and it was a social event or they went out in the evening, but they usually went out early in the morning and to draw. She goes out at high noon. Why? Because nobody goes out at that time when the heat of the day to get water because uh, uh, it's too hot. So she's protected from scorn and ridicule. And you know, when you read the narrative there, that she would have been open to that. She had five husbands and a man she was now living with. And why? In an, in, in an immoral society, they weren't amoral uh, like the Sodomites were, but they were immoral society. Why would they look down on her? Because when you look down on somebody else, you elevate yourself. And that's, that's self-preservation. That's a, that's a human characteristic. Is it a good one? No, it's not. But it's there. Now... Uh, and, and yet, uh, she said, uh, uh, evermore, give me this water. And, and he said, when he got engaged with that woman at the well, you know, he said, if you would ask me, I'd have given you the living water. Well, she didn't ridicule him. These guys saw a miracle. She never even met Jesus before. She says, how is it that thou, being a Jew, ask his drink of me, which am a, water, a woman of Samaria? The Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. You know why? Jesus looked like an ordinary Jew. The Bible says in Isaiah that there's no beauty in him that we should desire him. He didn't have the chiseled look of a Greek athlete. He looked like an ordinary Jew. And if you believed in him then, you would have taken the same amount of faith that 2,000 years later you would have to believe in him. And you'll see this right in here in the same context in here. But that woman says, evermore give me this water. And she says, well, go call your, oh, then she talks about, he says, go call your husband. She, I don't have any husband. And then she says, sir, I perceive that our prophet, our fathers worshiped in this mountain. So she turns the uh, conversation to religion. But the Jews say in Jerusalem, is, but he said, woman, you don't know what you're worshiping. Salvation is of the Jews. Is that true? Yes, Jesus is a Jew, and that's where we get our salvation. The word Jew comes from the tribe of Judah. Jesus was from the tribe of Judah, and it was prophesied that the Messiah would come from the tribe of Judah. She left her water pot and went into the town. Here's a woman that's afraid of ridicule. She goes into the town and says, come see a man who told me all things that ever I did. Is not this the Christ? And these Jews here wouldn't believe him when they saw a miracle, a great miracle the day before. Well, Moses, uh, he fed us uh, with manna. What signs show us now? I'm telling you, not only is unbelief dumb, it protects its stupidity. I mean, it, it defends it. But uh, the bread of God is he which cometh down from heaven and giveth life unto the world. Verse 34, then said they unto him, Lord, evermore give us this bread. Now Jesus is going to bring him through some strong doctrine because he knew who didn't believe on him. And I've said this years ago, even in my ignorance of this chapter here, the reason why Jesus preached this message was to get rid of driftwood. I've said it back then. I still maintain that same thought today. And Jesus said unto them, verse, 30, uh, verse 35, and Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life. And you can see he's easing him into it, but he's going to bring some doctrine. And I'm telling you something, we accept what's going to be said here in the rest of this chapter because it's been in there for 2,000 years. But let me just say, because we all have an imagination, we'll just imagine that we're in Palestine 2,000 years ago, and we hear about this rabbi, and we're part of the 5,000, and we're out there, and we just had a good meal yesterday, but we forgot all about that, and we want to see some more magic and, and, and all that sort of thing. And that's all they wanted to see. And then, and then he brings it, and we're going to get to it, but he says, and it, you're hearing it for the first time right now because it's 2,000 years ago in your imagination. And he says, except you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no part of me. 
Now we accept that 2,000 years later because it's been in holy writ for that long. But if you heard it for the first time, you would not accept it. If you will not accept the word of God now, you wouldn't have accepted it then. And we're going to see even Peter. We'll see that. In, in the, yeah, we're, we're on time, I think. I forgot how to tell time. And Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life. Uh, uh, he that cometh to me shall never hunger, and he that believeth in me shall uh, never thirst. Verse 36, but I say unto you that ye have seen me and believe not. All that the Father giveth me shall come to me, and him that cometh to me I will in no wise cast out. Isn't that a great verse? Is God ever going to get mad at you enough to cast you out? He said he won't, and he's either telling the truth or he's telling the lie. Yeah, but man, you don't know the way I've lived since I professed to be a Christian. Well, there's one thing you need to check on. You might want to check on to make sure you're really born again. But if you're really born again, he said, I'll in no wise cast you out. He said in John chapter 10, I and I give unto them eternal life. If it was conditional on your obedience, it would be temporal. It wouldn't be eternal. And he says, I give unto them. He didn't say, I will give unto them. And I know there's some brethren in here that are free will, and I'm not trying to attack you. I'm not trying to do that. I am telling you, this is doctrine. And it is not for a Baptist, for a Baptist benefit. It is for his honor and glory. Because he's able to keep that which he's committed unto him against that day. He's able to do it. Who are kept by the power of God. All that the Father giveth me shall come to me, and him that cometh to me I'll in no wise cast out. Verse 38, for I, I came, uh, for I came down from heaven not to do the will of, uh, not to do mine own will, but the will of him that sent me. And this is the Father's will which has sent me, that of all which he hath given me, I should lose nothing, but should rise, raise it up again at the last day. And this is the will of him that sent me, that everyone which seeth the Son and believeth on him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up at the last day. The Jews then murmured, again, uh, murmured uh, uh, at him because he said, I am the bread which came down from heaven. And they said, is not this Jesus? See, they did not believe he was God. John chapter 5, they were going to stone him. You know why? Because he declared himself to be God. In John chapter 10, he'll do it again. Thou being a man, makest thyself God. But they didn't believe it. They said, and listen to this. And you know, when Jesus was 13 years old and, they, and he was back at the temple when they were going back after the feast and, and, and Joseph and Mary, his mother, they looked for him among there and they went back. It took a day's journey. They went back there and they said, your, Mary says, your father and I have been troubled or something uh, because we haven't found you. And he says, knowest thou not that I must be about my father's business? He wasn't talking about carpentry. He was in the temple discussing the word of God and his father. Father is God. You see? Uh, so he says, uh, uh, and he said, is that this uh, Jesus, the son of Joseph, verse 42, whose father and mother we know? Well, they didn't know his father for sure, and this is evidenced in context here, uh, and that is God the Father. And mother we know, how is it then that uh, he saith, I came down from heaven. You know, Jesus, he said twice in his ministry, I have never, I have not found so great a faith. No, not in Israel. One was a Greek, a Syrophoenician woman, and one was a Roman centurion. And whoever should have ex expressed a faith in God should have been a Jew. But Jesus said these Gentiles did it, and he's never found that in Judaism. Uh, verse uh, 43, Jesus therefore answered and said unto them, Murmur not among yourselves. No man can come to me except the Father which hath sent me draw him, and I will raise him up the last day. Well, what does that mean? Is God draw everybody, or does he draw just a select few? Does he? That's something you need to answer. God, who would have all men to be saved and to come unto the knowledge of the truth. Amen. The grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared unto all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly and righteously and godly in this present world. The grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared unto all men. What does that make God if he offers you something that he never intended to give you? See, it is your unbelief that separates you from God, not God's belief. Uh, verse uh, 45, it is written in the prophets, and they shall, all, uh, they shall be all taught of God. 
Every man, therefore, that hath heard and hath learned of the Father cometh unto me. Why? Why? Jesus said in John 14, I am the way. He's not a way. Catholicism, Muslims, and all these other ones, they are a way. That's a way to hell, but it's not a, a, the way to heaven. That way is through the Lord Jesus Christ, who is the way, the truth, and the life. Verse 46, not that any man has seen the Father, save he which is of God, say he which is of God, he has seen the Father. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me hath everlasting life. I am the bread of life. Your fathers did eat manna in the wilderness and are dead. This is the bread which cometh down from heaven that a man may eat thereof and not die. And you know something? I am going to live forever. You say, well, the lost people are going to live forever. No, they're not. They're going to die forever. They're never going to be dead and cease to exist, but they are going to die forever. Uh, this is the bread which came down from heaven, and a man may eat thereof and not die. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If any man eat of this bread, he shall live forever, and the bread which I will give him is my flesh, which I will give uh, for the life of the world. Uh, the Jews, therefore, strove among themselves, saying, how, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? Then Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Except ye eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, ye have no life in you. I want to tell you a verse from Jeremiah. First, I'll give you John chapter 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, the Word was God. And then it says, The Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. Jeremiah said, Thy words were found. And I did eat them. Thy word was unto me the joy and rejoicing of my heart, for I am called by thy name, O Lord God of hosts. The Catholics believe that they, and I had one guy, and I actually did call him a liar to his face. I was an altar boy. I took communion, and I was raised in the reverence of that sort of thing, even though it's superstition. And yet he said to me, he said, I said, are you telling me, because he was quoting John chapter 6 as a Catholic, and I said, you're telling me that when you take that wafer in your mouth, it turns into flesh, and he goes, yeah. I said, you're a liar, and I told him that. Don't have any problems with that at all. I mean, it, it was much more of a conversation, and the guy was irritating the daylights out of me anyway, so I didn't mind calling him that, but I did call him a liar, because that's exactly what it was. It does not turn. It was a wafer when the, when the priest did the thing over it, and it was a wafer when he put it in your mouth, and it was a wafer when you, when you swallowed it, and you know what it was? It was nothing. It was nothing. Now, and Jesus said unto them, verse uh, 53, uh, verily, verily, I say unto you, except ye eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, ye have no, li I, I, ye have no, uh, you have no life in you. Whoso eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood and hath eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. My, for my flesh is meat indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He that eateth my flesh and drinketh... And I'm going to tell you something. Even after 2,000 years, this is hard to take doctrine. But I, I'm going to come to the same conclusion that Peter did when we finish this chapter here shortly. Uh, my uh, drink indeed, he that dwelleth in me and I in him. And uh, as the living father, verse 57, as the living father uh, has sent me and I live by the father, uh, so he that eateth my, me, even he shall live by me. This is that bread which came down from heaven, not as your fathers did eat manna in the wilderness, uh, and uh, he that eateth of uh, this bread shall live forever. Uh, these things said he in the synagogue as he taught in Capernaum. Uh, many therefore, now listen, division, uh, doctrine is divisive. Many therefore of his disciples which, he had, which heard this said, this is a hard saying, who can hear it? When Jesus knew in himself uh, that his disciples, and they're called the disciples, when his disciples murmured uh, at this, at it, he said unto them, Doth this offend you? 
What if you shall see the Son of Man ascend up where he was uh, before? Now listen, there might be some hard doctrine to take in the word of God, but one day, as a born-again, blood-washed child of God, I'm going to bow in his presence, and so are you. And it doesn't matter what you thought that you didn't understand and you didn't like about the word of God. It's his word. Now, if you don't like it or if you don't understand it, well, then you just pray about it. God says, call unto me, and I will... Uh, and I will answer thee and show thee great and mighty things which thou knowest not. And he didn't write the book for theologians. He wrote it for you and me, the common, ordinary, garden variety, vegetable uh, that we are uh, Christians. That's what he wrote it for. All scripture is given by inspiration of God, and it's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction and instruction in righteousness. Why? That the man of God, that word man is generic, it means a woman too, that the man of God may be perfect, Thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Now, why would, and in common sense, God says, come now and let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as white. When God invites us to reason with him, that's a high and lofty invitation. But it isn't reasonable that God would come in the flesh, in the likeness of sinful flesh, and take my sin on the cross and then make it hard for me to understand his word if I want to understand it. Doesn't make sense, does it? Does that mean I understand everything? No, but I'll tell you one thing, it is such a reward. I, even naturally, where I work, when I learn something, it is just like a revival in my work. I like learning something that makes my work easier. I like learning something that I thought about, and then when I practice and I found out it works. I love going through the Bible and learning something else that I didn't know before, even though I've been through it a number of times. I just keep going through it, but I like learning something that I didn't know before. And the Holy Spirit, you know why I didn't learn, know it before? I wasn't able to bear it, probably. Uh, what, uh, verse 62, uh, What and if ye shall see the Son of Man ascend up where he was before? It is the Spirit that quickeneth, the flesh profiteth nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit. They are life. Jesus said in the same gospel of John that the words that I speak unto you, the same will judge you on the last day. But they are spirit and they are life. We looked in uh, Galatians, walk in the spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Well, how do you walk in the spirit? Does that mean you walk around like this and you just have these starry eyes or you roll your eyes in the back of your head and you look like you're in some kind of trance? No, you walk in the spirit by walking in the word of God. Thy word is a lamp to my feet, a light unto my path. And you're going to stumble in darkness if you don't. In him was life, and that life was the light of men, and the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehendeth it not. So if you don't comprehend the Bible, it might tell you where you're at. And I'm not trying to browbeat anybody, and I'm not trying to, I, listen, if my words scare you, and, and just say, you weren't saved, and if my words scare you, how would you express the reality of being lost? If the words scare you, what about the experience of being lost forever? That's going to be a lot more frightening. So Paul says, examine yourself to see whether you be in the faith. Um, but these, uh, 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 it is the spirit that quit. Uh, verse 64, but there be some of you that, uh, but there were, there are some of you that believe not, for Jesus knew from the beginning who they were that believed not and who should betray him. Now, there was this multitude that said, this is a hard saying, and uh, who can hear it? And they walk no more with him. Jesus already knew that. They didn't take him by surprise. Now, you got an average preacher today of a large congregation. He'll do everything to hold that together. He'll compromise. He'll do anything to hold that together. Did Jesus do that? We're going to see something that was unique with Jesus uh, because he only had a few people left. And I mean, there's church splits, and I know preachers that go crazy over that, and then they try to, uh, uh, they, they, they self-examine themselves, and they wonder if they're too harsh or too hard or whatever, and they, and they, and they uh, cross-examine themselves and everything else, because, I mean, uh, you know, that's a big thing, and, but you're going to have those all the time. The, the, the most volatile organization on the face of the earth is the church of God. The most volatile organization on the face of the earth is the church of God. Why? Because Satan is fighting tooth and nail to divide it all the time. He doesn't do that with Ford Motor Company. Right? Now, uh, and he said, therefore I said unto you, no man uh, can come unto me except that we're given him of the Father, 
uh, verse 66, from that. Uh, now, I, so, when I teach Sunday school, people already know the t stand I took. I didn't take somebody else's word for it. I looked it up in history. I looked it up in the encyclopedia and everything. And I looked up how the King James Bible came about. And we have it. I only use the King James Bible. I will not go to a church that doesn't use the King James Bible. I've been to churches that only use the King James Bible, and they destroy the King James Bible, so I leave them. But I looked this up myself. When they translated, and I want to make that point here for this point here, it says, from that time, many walk no more with them. Let's read it the way it is. From that time, many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. The words that are italicized in the authorized version were put in there by the translator to make a transition from one language to another because you cannot really literally translate what one language says to another one. So you give the sense of it. See? Um, I was going to give an example, but I know I'll trip over my tongue. Uh, but anyway, um, uh, so they... they what they did was they called it padding or supplied words. And to indicate that they were not in the manuscripts that they were translating from, they italicized those words. Now, the reason why I want to make that point on this point, there's other, uh, I've read uh, many verses already that have italicized words. I don't find any problem with them at all, you know, because they do make the transition from an Aramaic or a Greek or a Hebrew word into our English way of thinking. Even our, even our language is in a state always constantly of uh, renewal or evolution, if you want to call it that way. We don't speak like the English did in, 16, uh, in the 17th century. We don't speak like that. See? And if you, had, if you had a copy of the, uh, of the uh, 1611 Bible, it would be hard to read because the F's looked like S's and the like was L-Y-Y-K-E and stuff like that, you know, you would, you, would have, you would need an interpreter anyway, you know, or just really slow down and read it. Now, it says, from that time, many, verse 66, from that time, many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. No, it wasn't from that time. It was from that, many of his disciples. What was that? It was the doctrine. It was the doctrine. Now, I, I, I'm not trying to prove a point. I don't even care if you disagree with me. But you consider it for yourself because that's what divides people in churches today is doctrine, is doctrine. The time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. Now, we're going to find out something about Peter here. Then said Jesus unto the twelve, will you also go away? He didn't say to them, you know, everybody left me. I'm glad, I'm glad you, I'm glad, and he turns to the twelve and he just says, I'm glad you're here with me. I, I just don't know what I would do. I'd be, be beside myself if you guys left. No, he said, will you also, he gave them an invitation. Listen to Peter here. And I'm going to tell you something that I believe with all my heart, that Peter did not know what he was talking about when he said, except you eat my flesh and drink my blood. And I'm glad that I feel that way about him because he applied something that I apply myself when I come to the word of God and there's things that I don't understand. Let me read it first. Then said Jesus, verse 67, then said Jesus unto the twelve, will you so also go away? Then Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life, and we believe and are sure, and are sure that thou art the Christ, uh, the Son of the living God. Jesus answered them, have not I chosen you twelve, uh, uh, have not I chosen you twelve, and one of you is a devil? He spake of Judas Iscariot, the, one, the son of Simon, uh, uh, for he it was that should be, uh, betray him, being one of the twelve. Now, that's, uh, we know that. First of all, um, here's the thing. Peter says, to whom shall we go? I'm confident, and if I'm not sure, I will ask him when I meet him. Peter is as much as my brother as Bob is, or as Mel is. He is as much as my brother. Just because he's dead, we have this idea like they have no feelings or anything. I hear speakers, and it makes me so mad, it makes me want to punch them, is when they say, oh yeah, Peter, the only time he opened up his mouth was to change feet. I'm telling you, the only time I've seen an example of that is when a speaker says that. 
I'm telling you, he's my brother. And God used him to give us holy writ. And how does somebody have the audacity and the nerve to say that about somebody except they're exalting themselves? But Peter said, to whom shall we go? Thou? If you would have asked Peter at that time, I'm confident, if you would have said, Peter, did you understand what he said when he said, except you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no part of me? I'm confident he would have said in all honesty, I have no idea. But I do know one thing, that he has the words of eternal life. To whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. And when you see doctrine that's hard to chew on, then you pray about it. And if God doesn't give you an answer, then you just go on. He'll give you something that you can swallow. Listen, folks, we need to, how are you going to defend the word of God in the days of apostasy? Well, you're not going to tell everybody else they need to believe it. You as an individual believe it, and it'll be infectious, and somebody else will believe it. I'm telling you, uh, we mentioned that in Sunday school, I think it was this morning or it might have been last week, when God had the children of Israel go into battle and he, and, he, and he had them and he had them set up and it was very systematic. They just didn't say, hey, you bunch of guys go on over there. There was captains over tens. There was captains over hundreds. There was captains over thousands. They were organized. But they said, if anyone has a fearful, if anyone's fearful, you cut them out and send them back home. You know why? Because that fear and that cowardice will spread through the troops like wildfire. I'm telling you, we need to make a personal stand for yourself. And I need to do it for myself, for God, and the authority of his word. Amen. Whether anybody else likes it or not, you should earnestly contend for the faith. Amen. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for your word. We thank you that it is forever settled in heaven.